Hello, YouTube. Today I'm here with, very excited to be here with Armani Talks. Someone I found, it seems like three or four years ago on Twitter and was very impressed by his content that he was putting out with a very philosophical approach on how you can improve your social skills, how you can improve your, your communication skills, especially for people who are more introverted or work in technical fields. So very excited to have you on today. And it looks like we're live here. So how's it going today, Armani? Or is it Armand? Hey, you, so people call me Armand, Armani. When I first came to the country, most yeah. people couldn't say Armand. Okay. Uh, whenever I would tell them that, they'll be like, uh, Armando, uh, Armand. <laughs> so I would eventually say Armani without the I. Yeah. And then they'd be like, oh, it's Armand. Yeah. So nowadays I just go by both Armani or Armand. Awesome, awesome. Well, great to have you on. I'm so excited. And I thought, you know, since we haven't really met before, except online, I would start with an icebreaker question, which is, what is something not a lot of people know about you, Armani Talks? Sure. So a few things. Um, one thing is um, I'm a black belt um, in uh, Taekwondo. I don't know if I brought that up before, but that was one of the predecessors of me, you know, starting public speaking mm -hmm. because I got very curious about how the body works by doing Taekwondo, different forms, structures, being a part of a club. And I could also solve a Rubik's cube. So those are two things that I'm sure people wouldn't know about me. So, yeah. yeah. That's cool. Did you look it up or did you figure it out on your own, the Rubik's cube? So I actually, you ever watched the movie Pursuit of Happiness? I have, yes. Yeah, yeah. so I, I recall watching it with a bunch of my friends one time mm -hmm. and I was I saw that one scene where Will Smith solves a Rubik's cube yeah. and for some reason it resonated with me Yeah, and I blurred out, I'm going to solve it too. <laughs> and then all my friends were like, you can't solve that. Uh, that's for smart people. Oh. And around that time, YouTube was just starting to grow. Um, this was when YouTube had certain videos, but not too many. Yeah. So luckily I came to find out that YouTube, has people already solving it for you. Mm -hmm. So they thought it was like, you know, you got to be super smart to do that. But it's really just a formula you got to learn. And yeah. once you learn it once, you just can't unlearn it. It's just you see it there. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a good lesson for life. Actually, there's a lot out there that you can just find out. Um, and people just give up. They say, I'm not smart enough. I can't do it. So they kind of give up. It's, that's a good point. For sure. For sure. There's so many different little formulas. If you start looking for it, especially towards a certain field and you see it once it's difficult to unsee it because now your experiences are tied with it. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, very good. Thank you for sharing that. It's cool. So black belt in Taekwondo and Rubik's cube. Um, next, I wanted to ask you sort of to get an idea, what inspired you to help people with leveling up their communication and social skills? I believe one of the best things to do is, get better at your own setbacks. Either whenever you're investing in a hobby, you want to ask yourself, is this something that could be fun for me? Or is this something that scares me? Because in both of these situations, there's emotions connected with it. Yeah. And when you have the emotions connected with it, you're much more likely to commit to it long term. Mm -hmm. So for me, the reason that I wanted to help others level up their communication skills was because I sucked at it for a very, very long time, um, especially moving from a different country to the US. One quirk was that I struggled with English. The second quirk was that I struggled with shyness because I struggled with English. Yeah. Due to shyness, I struggled with speaking up in public speaking settings. So these three factors were something that I wanted to reverse engineer myself out of. I was in a very technical field like engineering yeah. and we mainly solve problems. So traditionally we solve hard skills problems, but younger me was curious about solving soft skills problems. And I wanted to codify it in a way where other engineers can understand because engineers think in very uh, black or white sort of way. There's no gray in the middle, like vibes, energy, that stuff that uh, the language that they don't like. So I saw it as a challenge to be able to codify communication skills. So someone that's extremely technical can learn the art of creative writing, giving a speech where they could be funny, crack a joke or two, and do interviews by showing their personality as well. 
Yeah. So just to answer your question, it's because it started off as a fear. My emotions were involved in it, and that compelled me to do something about it. Okay. Started off as this fear. You were shy. What was that journey like of overcoming shyness? Like, how did that go? It was tough because I don't know how much of your viewers are shy themselves, yeah. but anytime that you're trying to overcome shyness, it's as though the world is trying to actually challenge you a lot, basically trying to see how bad you want it. Yeah. And just to give you a quick little story, there was a period when I was enrolling in a gym with my older brother. Mm -hmm. And as we were enrolling, there was this guy that was supposed to be showing us around the entire gym, right? Did you ever have those one of the personal trainer guys? Give me yeah, the he door? walks around, tells you like, this is what we got. Yeah. Yeah. And this was around that era when I was trying to overcome shyness. So I was trying to speak up a little bit more. And this trainer, the entire time, he's just over here looking at my brother and directly talking to him the entire time. Yeah. Every now and then I'm trying to like sneak in a comment he'll kind of like look at me like, mm -hmm. and then he's just, just going back talking to my brother some more. Yeah. And this is just like the entire tour. So eventually I'm starting to think, okay, I mean, clearly he's my older brother. So he's thinking that the older one is going to have the ultimate buying decision. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to sell to the older person. So it comes to a point where I'm like, I'm getting a little bit disengaged. Yeah. And as we're wrapping up the tour, this trainer just kind of looks at me. And he's like, you don't say much, do you? And when he said that, I got so angry at the guy. But this is something that a lot of shy people go through, where as they're trying to overcome shyness, there's like these little random roadblocks that are thrown their way. And you can't read about it in a book. It's just the world basically testing you whether or not you want to overcome shyness or not. And when you don't have that desire to overcome shyness, you most likely won't. You most likely will be the guy that's like, oh, it's just going to go away on its own. But that's just not how the real world works. Yeah, that's a cool point. I'm, I used to be shy too. And it's, it's weird because I'm very extremely extroverted nowadays. So I would consider myself an extroverted entrepreneur. <laughs> instead oh, of dope. Um, but when I remember in high school, that was like one of the worst things you could say because it made me feel so awkward when someone would say, you don't talk much. You're very shy. Why don't you say something? Because it was just like putting you on the spot. I used to, I used to hate that. How, how do you think people should react to that if that happens to them? Well, this is one of those situations where it's all about the narrative. Yeah. Because when, when I was younger, there wasn't really information regarding overcoming shyness where you're just kind of, as you just mentioned, it's a weird question to ask because how do you respond back to it? Yeah. You see? But nowadays, if it could be reframed in a way where it's, you know, this is that thing that Armani guy was saying, uh, the world's trying to test me to see whether I want it or not. Yeah. And if you could rise to the occasion and use this as an opportunity to exercise your humor, I don't know, I I'm just quiet right now because I'm thinking about roasting you in five minutes or so. <laughs> this just turns it into a funny situation yeah. and it works out the social muscle, which makes it easier the next time you get a question like that yeah that's a good point i wish i could go so back you, in high school <laughs> so you you mentioned your personality evolved it did that's really weird and people are very surprised when i say i would barely talk at all in high school and now i'm a public speaker i love talking <laughs> yeah i mean that's the that's actually a very unique little revelation because i traditionally am of the stance that personality is dynamic uh, yeah. where some people identify a little too much with introversion and yeah. some people identify too much with extroversion. But I believe as people, uh, a lot of us are just ambiverts where we're capable of changing and we can display introverted, extroverted like tendencies, depending on the stage of our lives we're in, the environment, skill sets that we acquire. Yeah, that's cool. I, I believe the same thing. I wasn't going to say it, but I believe personality is dynamic and you can practice being one way or the other kind of, or you can like change on the identity level. If that makes sense. It sounds kind of weird, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, ha have you seen any of your like friends or acquaintances where they used to be really extroverted, but the older they got, uh, they became more introverted. It's basically the reverse of what happened to you. I I've seen a few people like that. Yeah. It, it happened to me in my social circle. So I don't know about if it happened to you as well. Yeah. 
That's, yeah, I've always thought that was interesting, but I, I believe people can change for the better or for the worse, depending on the choices they make. For sure. Uh, so why, why is that important for your, let, let me ask it this a different way. What's rewarding about the work that you do of helping people improve their communication skills? The, the reward really comes down to the ripple effects. And yeah. just to tell you what I mean by that, yeah. there was a client that I was working with, I would say roughly around the beginning of 2019. Mm -hmm. He was one of the smartest guys I've worked with, a brilliant entrepreneur. Uh, he has this company that deals with uh, cement, where he supplies cement to other manufacturing firms. Yeah. And uh, due to the rise in, you know, the digital world, digital communications, mm -hmm. he really wanted to put himself out there. He wanted to start recording LinkedIn videos, start a YouTube channel, a podcast, mm -hmm. but he was just overthinking a lot. He thought other people were going to just be talking about him and judging him. Mm -hmm. So we ended up working together and throughout our journey, we created a private YouTube channel where you could create the channel, make the videos private, and we would work on his ideas, his delivery, his ability to speak to a camera. Yeah. And the more that we worked on it, the more confidence he built. And I was able to be with him when he uploaded his first LinkedIn video, wow. which ended up crushing it. Uh, he, gave, he gave like a lot of practical insights for entrepreneurs. Yeah. And the video ended up crushing it. That did a bunch for his confidence. He eventually ended up launching a podcast where nowadays he invites industry leaders on. And I mean, who knows the amount of value that's generated where top tier entrepreneurs are coming to his podcast, mm -hmm. giving practical tips. Plus, I mean, a lot of the business deals that happens behind the scenes. So that's one of the joys regarding what I do. It's a lot of the ripple effects that happen where someone will go on to start a YouTube channel. Someone will go check out their Toastmasters near them mm -hmm. where they didn't even know that they thought Toastmasters was a place to eat kind of like I help. Um, but now they understand it's a public speaking club. Mm -hmm. They understand the value of journaling. So that's what I try to do with my company, bring awareness to how words can change your mind, which eventually changes your behaviors. Yeah. Very cool. You mentioned journaling. I want to go a little off script here. Um, I also enjoy journaling, but I'm not really like disciplined with it. I just like write whatever's on my mind. So I'm just like, you know, Free flow. You, won't you won't believe what Stacy said and things like that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, what what's your journaling practice like? How has that evolved over time, and how did it start? My journaling practice is actually very simple. It's yeah. pretty much what you just described. Yeah. It's the free flow method, where I don't believe it too much in having that rigid practice from the beginning stages, because um, if you stick with it long enough, you'll notice that as you're free flowing writing whatever's on your mind, mm -hmm. natural patterns begin to emerge. Yeah. And nowadays, I'll just write a page a day. And I treat Twitter sort of like a public journal as well. So it's okay. so a two and one sort of uh, sort of grind. Do, do you write by hand? Just out of curiosity? I use a website called 750 words and I type it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. See, you could do a Microsoft doc, 700 words. You could you could uh, handwrite it. Mm -hmm. Journaling is a lot like your weightlifting practice. It really comes down to what you want. And I recommend for most of your listeners, mm -hmm. start off with free flow. Uh, just get in the habit of writing whatever's on your mind. Mm -hmm. And then eventually you could get more advanced. You could have a little gratitude practice, affirmations, but that's all on a case by case basis. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, I think that's good advice. I, I appreciate that. Um, I want to see like in your life, as you started your own journey from, you said being very shy to, you know, someone who teaches people how to do communication and improve their communication skills. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned during that, that journey? One of the biggest lessons I learned is that people really don't care too much. And this hurts certain people. They're like, oh, they don't care about me like that. All for other people, they're like, whoa, they really don't care about me like that. This is good news, which means I can experiment more. Uh, one of my earlier YouTube videos, I was learning how to do the editing stuff. And on one of the videos, for some reason, I started modifying it as it was exporting. Mm -hmm. 
And once I uploaded the video, my face for the first 30 seconds of the video was like, <laughs> it was just stuck like that for 30 plus seconds. Yeah. And a few of my viewers hit me up and they were just like, Hey, um, I don't know if you know this, but you're frozen for the first 30 seconds. Yeah. And that just happens to be the video that YouTube's recommending to a brand new audience. So the first time some people came in contact with Armani Talks brand, it just means doing, <laughs> looking like a doofus. Yeah. But, you know, with repetition, eventually people forgot. And it's just, that's just what communication skills is really about. It's about starting to change your mindset in regards to um, repetition. Like, for example, with you, bro, uh, imagine you're eating a bunch of grapes, mm -hmm. okay? Like a handful of grapes. And one of the grapes falls onto the ground, but you have a bunch of grapes left. Are you going to like dive to the ground, pick up that muddy grape, wipe it off and eat it? Probably not. Man. Probably not. Cause you have a bunch of other grapes yeah. and communication. Strong communication is all about making that little shift. Like quit focusing on the muddy grape and focus on all the other grapes that you have, because those all represent opportunities. And it's all about repetition. I'm one of the guys that, you know, nothing was given. It's all about just hard work, consistency, and yeah. finding out throughout your journey what you want. Awesome. The the analogy with the the grape, the muddy grapes, reminded me of something. It reminded me actually of anxiety, which is oh, like yeah. when you focus on the bad thing that happened. Like, oh, that was so awkward. What I said to that person, and you just kind of focus on that, which I used also used to struggle with uh, in the past. What advice do you have for people who do that, where they're just like, I can't believe I said that. Their per person probably forgot, right? Mm -hmm. so, like, what, what advice would you have for that situation? I guess social anxiety. With social anxiety, I always recommend, um, so social anxiety happens due to the spotlight effect. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of that? Not, not, no, I'm not too familiar. Yeah, so this is whenever, um, l let's imagine you're about to go to a networking event. Uh, like, as soon as you're about to enter, something in the subconscious mind thinks that all the heads are going to turn around and there's going to be this ambiguous group looking at you. Yeah. Uh, this is basically the spotlight effect where we put an invisible spotlight over us and think that everyone is micromanaging each of our moves. Mm -hmm. The fix for that is to take the spotlight off of us and put it on someone else. Wow. And that's the uh, formula for charisma. It's uh, a charismatic person is capable of putting more focus on the other person. And that's what, from my um, observation, kills social anxiety, or better yet, turns social anxiety into social energy. So that's what I would recommend. If someone is going through social anxiety, start reframing it as social energy. And this is, I don't know about your Toastmasters Club, but this yeah. was actually a tip that I still uh, work with in my Toastmasters Club, where yeah. someone's like, oh my, I have speech anxiety. Yeah. I was like, no, 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 you have speech energy. And it doesn't seem like much in like when you say it, but it's just, you plant the seed. And the more that you keep doing it, the more that your perception starts to flip in regards to, oh, whoa, I'm actually feeling energy. Yeah. And now what you used to be scared of is actually helping you out. Yeah, that's a cool reframe. I've never thought about that. So reframe social anxiety as social energy. Yeah, because anxiety and energy are both, physical feelings plus perception. Our goal isn't to try to kill the physical feelings. Our goal is to modify the perception mm -hmm. and words are perception programmers. So if you could just play around with that variable of perception, mm -hmm. now the physical energy sort of uh, goes from crippling you yeah. to empowering you. Okay, that's awesome. I really love that. That's a cool idea. It reminds me of like this idea of like everything's neutral. It's really how you look at it, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. I could be like, I wish the sun would go away because I don't know. I like the nighttime, you know, or I could be like, Oh, it's such a beautiful day outside. It's Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it was like a quote. I forgot who said it. Someone's like, uh, words are the knife that we use to slice reality Ooh. or words are magnifying glasses for the mind. Yeah. And if you could start being a little bit more mindful of how you choose your words, it actually starts changing your perception, which is yeah. a pretty cool ph phenomenon. That is cool. I love that. That's a, that's an, a really cool reframe. And it, it's cool because you could also use that formula, right? You said codify it for other things. So you could take this idea of reframing a lot of things that seem negative into positives. Yeah. I mean, the whole uh, phrase of 
let's say someone's very nervous to do interviews. So they're like, oh, man, I, I, I have to do this interview at 12 p.m. today. Instead of saying I have to, just start saying I get to. And when you say that, it's like whether you're aware of it or not, you're planting the right seeds. And now you're associating a positive perception with the interview. Yeah. That's awesome. I get to reframe. I like that. I get to reframe it. There we go. I get to reframe it or I have to, I have to reframe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, just um, go ahead. These, these micro moves add up because I mean, like as we're talking right now, I could already tell, you know, you have good energy and this is something that you can't logic with yourself too much because on a subconscious level, we're capable of processing it. So if you're having these little tools where you can change your perception, which gives you a more empowering energy, then you don't need to really try too much. As someone who's struggling with social anxiety a lot is focusing on the micros too much. Like what kind of words do I use? Uh, what do I say to you know, say the right thing in the conversation? Uh, yeah. What is the perfect question to ask? But focus on the macro. The focus on the energy by first feeling good yourself. And you start feeling good yourself through the little practices that we're discussing in this podcast. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I appreciate that. It's a, it's a great idea. It's like, don't focus on these little details because you'll get lost in it. It's like, focus on um, the bigger picture. Exactly. Um, let's say, and I see this very often. I'm thinking of like a hypothetical, really smart person who lacks confidence. So like super smart, but not a lot of social skills, lacks confidence, or maybe does have social skills, but just doesn't speak up. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give that person if they were watching? What I would recommend, and this is going to sound a little hokey pokey, is mm -hmm. gratitude. Yeah. Uh, treat gratitude like an athlete. So rather than just doing it every now and then when you feel like it, tr train like an athlete with gratitude. Mm -hmm. And an athlete views everything like a muscle. And the main purpose of gratitude, we start to take it seriously once we understand a little bit of the theory regarding it. So, so let me just give you an example real quick. Mm -hmm. Imagine I come to your place and you know I get a whole bunch of bricks and I just toss it in your front yard. Mm -hmm. You're going to be like, yo, man, why are you dumping all this garbage on my front yard? Mm -hmm. Then I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Uh, you didn't give me time to pick up the cement. So I go to Office Depot or Home Depot, or wherever, mm -hmm. pick up the cement. I come back and I structured those bricks in a way where now you have a guest house. Mm -hmm. At this point, you're going to be like, yo, thank you, man. I appreciate you for hooking me up like this. Mm -hmm. So the analogy is that the bricks are our experiences. So the smart guy that you're talking about, he has tons of bricks, but the problem is that he's not cementing them together. So he doesn't, he has a bunch of junk rather than the guest house. Mm -hmm. So gratitude is all about cementing your experiences together and making yourself aware of what makes you valuable in the first place. Yeah. And the more that you keep on cementing your experiences together, the more confident that you become. And from that confidence, social skills is a byproduct. Okay. Very cool. I love that analogy. It really, it makes sense. Um, you start cementing it in with that gratitude pr process. Um, very cool. And one more tip is uh, yeah. focus micro uh, mm -hmm. because with gratitude, it's easy to be like, oh, I got my new job today. I got my degree. I got another promotion. Just focusing on the big stuff. Yeah. But that conditions the mind to just keep looking for the big stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you could look for the small stuff, or it's like in your case, you know how to tie a tie, which a lot of people don't know how to do, um, yeah. which is pretty big. Uh, if you can make yourself aware of that, now becoming aware of the big stuff is a byproduct. Okay. Very cool. So focus on the small things when it comes to gratitude and train like an athlete, really lock it in there, cement it. Yeah, sure. because when you use a phrase like athlete, it mm -hmm. becomes real rather than like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just do the practice whenever I feel like it. Yeah. No, I'm going to do it like an athlete. And now it's like, now you frame yourself as the top performer. Yeah, that's cool. So it's also using that framing too. That's so very cool. Um when did you dis discover that you enjoyed public speaking? So now we're going to switch more towards public speaking, giving speeches. Uh, when did you discover that that was something that you enjoyed doing? Probably by speech number six. Okay. Uh, there was a period when I joined three Toastmasters clubs. Yeah. One, um, one was 
the home base. This is the one that I would routinely go to. Mm-hmm. Eventually, I joined the one at my job at the time, and yeah. I decided I was going to join one more. So as I was a part of different groups, uh, a lot of the anxiety, the speech anxiety, was now starting to become a thrill. It's kind of like when you're watching a uh, really great uh, Netflix show or yeah. you're on a roller coaster. I was starting to get that thrill. And I started to notice that I had the ability to make different people laugh or learn something. And after the speech, when someone's like, yo, I actually never thought about it like that. And I'm sure you've gotten that uh, as well before. It's like, I never thought about it like that. Yeah. That's when it became a drug in a good way. Um, <laughs> not, not the bad kind of drugs. Um, for your Toastmasters, you guys have table topics, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. So that's what initially just made me love public speaking, mm-hmm. the impromptu speech section where, you know, people give you a random topic and you're able to create something from thin air regarding it. Mm-hmm. And in the Eastern culture, uh, there's actually an art of turning concentration into um, the arts. So basically, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but basically there's this one person who's skilled at concentration Mm -hmm. and they're surrounded by a group of people who give this person random topics. And this guy has to create poetry, short stories, songs out of all these different topics on the spot. So that's what table topics sort of reminded me of. So to answer your question, by speech six, I was starting to see, huh, like this is, you're, you're in the creation process and you could give value to other people by having fun. Yeah, that's awesome. So you discovered those, those rewards, basically you unlocked it. Like this is, this is actually cool. It can be a thrill and it's awesome to be able to help people and see those ripple effects that you mentioned. Yeah. And it helps that this is the uh, number one fear on the planet. So, you know, you conquer or different studies say that they say glossophobia is number one. I don't know how accurate the studies are, but I, what I do know is that a lot of people struggle with public speaking. So someone who wants a confidence boost, learn public speaking. You just conquered the number one fear on the, or one of the top fears in the planet. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. What are some game changing ideas you've come across in your public speaking journey? Like that took you from sort of where you were at the beginning to where you are now. I, one of the key ideas is that if you could talk to five people, you could talk to 500 people. I I came to realize this when I was doing uh, different speeches at weddings where it was the same exact formula. One, another idea that was game changing was do lock and hold versus scanning where if you're a newbie public speaker, you're probably going to try to look at every single one at the same time. You ever tried that before? You're just like, (laughs) giving yourself anxiety. But I recommend that you choose three people, one from left, one from middle, one from right, and lock and hold a conversation with them. It's preferred that they're the most engaged members, and you'll typically spot those guys. They're kind of nodding their heads a lot. They're smiling. You could just tell that they're more engaged than the rest. Mm -hmm. The beauty regarding that is all the people around those three selected individuals think that you're looking at them. So rather than now giving yourself a panic attack, you're over here just looking at three people and you're killing many birds with one stone. So those are the two key ideas. The, if you could speak to five, you could speak to 500 Mm -hmm. and you don't need to look at every single member in the audience. A three is plenty as you're getting started. Yeah. Very cool. Great ideas. And that you said you had um, spoken at you've, you've, uh, done public speaking at weddings. Have you officiated a a marriage before? I'm curious. No. So it was funny because one of the weddings that I was a part of, um, just a a quick thing. Yeah. Eastern weddings are very, very different than Western weddings where if you could, if you could, (laughs) I do a speech and an Eastern wedding that's props to you because in the East, people don't want to hear speeches. They want to hear the songs, the dancing, Uh, the speeches are kind of seen as uh, noise. We're in the West. You know, when someone is giving a speech, everyone's like, quiet down, quiet down. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the speeches I did, you know, it went very well. And afterwards, some of the people were like, yo, you should have just been the MC. 
because the MC that they actually hired <laughs> wasn't um, wasn't uh, the best. So um, I thought about it. Uh, I was like, huh, I wonder how this business model is like being an MC at a wedding. Yeah. And I, I, I got my wish where um, I was a part of this business networking group in Tampa. Yeah. And one of the guys owns a, a wedding business, a wedding planning business. And he had me shadow him. And, you know, I saw all the, like the prep work the MC has to do and all the emotions they have to deal with from the groom, the bride, all that stuff. Yeah. I'm like, no, nah, I'll just watch this one from afar <laughs> rather than <laughs> participating. All that drama. Dude, weddings are crazy. Um, you, ever, you ever done that before? The MC? I've, I've officiated a wedding, yeah. Oh, MC wise? MC, not the whole time. I just did like the, the part where it's like, do you take this? You know, like. Oh, gotcha. I uh, did a speech before that. It was my brother's wedding. So it was like, uh, they asked me to do it. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, it went smooth. It did. Yeah. It went pretty well. It went pretty good. Nice. Um, it's a good, good, good experience. A lot of fun, but I know it's stressful. They're like, you have to go over there. Like, it seems like my brother, when he was getting married, it's like, go over there, go over there, go over, go there. over there, do this, do that. <laughs> You're basically um, working with a lot of different emotions. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, how could someone go from being a good public speaker? You know, they're, they're decent. Everyone's like, yeah, that's great. Jo good job. To someone who's great and someone who really like is out there like changing people's perspectives on things. I recommend it's honestly about practicing and introspection where you're starting to understand what topics you want to talk about because that's all public speaking is. It's T-O-L-D, thinking out loud and the loud, the L and D are combined. Yeah. But that's what all communication is. You're just thinking out loud. So you kind of want to figure out what it is that your interests are. What can you talk about for five to 10 hours? And people are like, Man, shut up already. You've been talking for five to 10 hours. And you're like, I have. And if you could speak about topics like that, where you don't have to research way too much, it's because you're embodying that knowledge, then it becomes much easier to deliver your message. And I believe that's how you go from good to great. And one more tip is that not everyone's ever going to like you where you'll certain you'll sometimes see very polished speakers where they look like, you know, you look at this guy, you're like, I mean, I know he's a speaker and there's a certain segment of people that love those kinds of speakers. While there's another group of people that are like, I don't know, uh, something about this guy just isn't authentic. I just can't put my finger on it. Yeah. Despite this guy displaying the traits of the public perfect speaker, Mm -hmm. On the other hand, and I'm sure you've probably seen this, mm -hmm. in Toastmasters, there's a lot of people who have accents, mm -hmm. and some of them may want to kill off their accent, but not so fast because there's a group that resonates with it. Yeah. So never try to appeal to everyone. Just introspect, understand where you stand on certain ideas, mm -hmm. and be okay with being loved by few, neutral towards some, and despised by many. It is what it is. Yeah, that's cool. That's a good point. It's like, um, just be yourself. I think I, that's kind of what I got from that. Is like, be yourself, and better yet, understand yourself. Okay, that's awesome. Understand yourself. Um, we were going to talk about building a following on Twitter. You said you focus more on websites, so I thought I would make that more general. How do you build a following on social media? Like, how did you do that? How did that start? Sure. So in the beginning stages, it's just about uh, posting, uh, creating some value regarding your experiences. Mm -hmm. Your That's what Twitter pretty much is. It's just, I think it's best if you treat it like a journal where different people discuss different strategies. They do a whole bunch of market research beforehand, and then they create content strictly for that market. Mm -hmm. I think that's fine, but my strategy has been treating it like a journal and try to network with different people behind the scenes. Uh, I'll every now and then shoot people a DM if I'm resonating with something they said, or they'll shoot me a DM because content pretty much just serves as energy that other people can be attracted to or magnetized towards. So to grow a following, be consistent, uh, create on a platform that resonates with you and do some networking as well. Okay. 
do some networking, almost you said treat it like a journal. And yeah, the networking is really amazing what you can do networking. I think it's crazy that I'm interviewing someone from, you're from Florida, right? <laughs> yeah, Tampa, Florida. I just think that's interesting that, you know, I think it's cool. That it's very interesting. Things can happen. Mm -hmm. it, it, and we're connected to, through what, Zoom? And yeah. we have a little bit of technology. We didn't have to run it by anyone. Like me and you were able to coordinate this ourselves. So yeah. there's no boss figure in this situation. Yeah. So, I mean, the opportunities are really endless at this point. Yeah. If you can think about it, you can at least try to make it go happen. You can make it happen at some point in the future, probably. Absolutely. Because w with you, I mean, you already had the agenda, everything planned, and we could have brainstormed. We could have bought this into existence. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, you know, if you're networking with the right people, you could bring something to the table. They could bring something to the table. And when you combine it, something completely new is made. Yeah. That collaboration, I think that's that's really powerful too. I agree with you on that. Um, when you work together, do that networking. So you started on Twitter. I know now you have a, a big following in lots of places, right? You have the YouTube channel, um, which we'll mention in a little bit. But um, why, why did you start on Twitter? So I started on Twitter because I was restarting the Toastmasters program. Mm -hmm. I, I finished it one time before. And the second time I wanted to do Pathways. Mm -hmm. So as I was doing Pathways, uh, which for your audience is where you get to choose your certain speaking path. Yeah. Uh, you could do leadership, teamwork, comedy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. When I started to redo that, I was like, you know, let me just um, create a Twitter and write down my insights. Yeah. Initially, I was going to call it Armani Speaks. Mm -hmm. But last second, I was like, no, nah, no, nah, let me just call it Armani Talks. Yeah. And I started uh, tweeting consistently. And there was one account uh, who went by the name Western Mastery at the time. I don't know if he still goes by that particular name who eventually gave me a shout out and different people found my account. Yeah. And from there, I mean, I was just doing business as usual. I was just writing my tweets based off of my uh, Toastmasters experience. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got a DM one day from a man from Australia who had a uh, best man speech coming up and he needed some assistance. Yeah. And I was like, well, you know, I may have to charge you just joking around. I didn't know if he was going to actually pay me. Yeah. Um, but he's just like, how much? We worked it out. And two minutes in, he sends the PayPal notification. Wow. And that's when I was able to understand that Twitter is one thing. Content creation is one thing. But if you're smart enough, you could also have a business approach to it as well. Mm -hmm. And that's what allowed me to keep focusing on Twitter and see it from a different angle rather than just a social media tool. Okay. So that kind of took it to like, oh, it can be a business thing as well. And I know a lot of people make money on Twitter, including you, right? You have courses. Books. Yeah. I, yeah. I, so I have, um, I'm an author as well. So I have books. Yeah. Uh, I have consultations. I have um, different classes as well, where everything's organized into one. So you're not scattering around all of YouTube. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so there's a lot of money-making opportunities. Where in the last section, we were talking about social opportunities. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you could also uh, create assets, digital assets. Yeah. Let's speak on that because I find that fascinating. Um, I haven't created too many digital assets. I do a nonprofit uh, webinar monthly, and I started that back in December. That was one of the things I said. So Armani wrote, this is going way off on a tangent. Armani wrote a blog post about Conor McGregor's visualization practice. And I started following it, basically, this idea of like you walk around, listen to music and visualize what you want. And that was one of the things I visualized was speaking to make money, but I didn't make money myself. I just did it to charity, but um, that's, that's so cool. cool. Yeah. <laughs> cause I, I knew you read the post, but I didn't know like, cause some people read something, but they don't apply it, but it's yeah. dope to see that you applied it as well. Yeah. I don't apply everything I read, but I tried, I'm trying to go less in the direction of reading a bunch of books, but not doing anything and more like reading the same books over and over and <laughs> doing what they say. Um, yeah dad, poor dad there's some back there um what was I, I, I see your reading list it's nice yeah <laughs> i see a few of them at least um i'm a financial planner so that's like they're mostly finance books they're on money but yeah, it's good stuff um yeah so let's talk a little bit about that because i find that very interesting creating digital assets digital products someone who has that vision in their mind what advice would you give to them 
So I would recommend they start to understand what is their strength. Do they like writing? Do they like speaking? Because most content creation is in either one of those variations. If you're a speaker, start a podcast or a YouTube channel. And if you're a writer, you know, you could do a blog, email list, Twitter, et cetera. And then learn storytelling where storytelling is just a connection of ideas. And it's best when you're viewing your life as a story. Okay. And then from there, I mean, there's so many different business models, dude, where, you know, you could do YouTube, you could keep posting videos. Uh, you could eventually, once you hit 4,000 watch hours, 1,000 subscribers, turn on ads. Mm -hmm. So anytime someone watches your video, you get paid a little. Yeah. So it's kind of like little employees giving you money at the end of every single month. Yeah. And if you could start viewing it like that, then digital assets become unique. Uh, also, like, let's say you write a book. A book is something that uh, can compound over time. With Amazon nowadays, you could become independently published rather than, you know, signing with a big publishing company. You get more freedom to write about what you want. So the opportunities are endless. Um, it really just comes down to what sort of medium do you want to get started off in? Do you want to mainly write or do you want to mainly speak? And it's not like you're just stuck in that lane for life. You can always hop where I started off in Twitter and nowadays I do YouTube. So yeah. you, you don't want to overwhelm yourself in the beginning. Just find something that's working a tad bit and then expand from there. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And you mentioned, you know, writing books is one of your products. Could you tell us a little bit about your new book, Wordplay 101 Short Stories, Essays, and Insights to Approve? I saw it on Amazon. Looks like it's highly rated. Yes. Uh, way to flex right those here. muscles. Oh, oh, awesome. Oh, you can't even. Yeah. So, green screen, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. So, Wordplay um, is a, what I call the new era of books, where nowadays plenty of different people want to read. But unfortunately, they just don't have the time to read a book from beginning to end. Some people do, but a lot of people, as their lives get more hectic, find it difficult to finish the book from beginning to end. Research shows that only a small group of people actually finish it, while most people only read 15% before they pick up another book. So the way that the wordplay, the book is designed, is that it's 101 short stories, essays, and insights, which are not connected to one another. Mm -hmm. So you could just, after a long day, open the book, find a certain a section that resonates with you. Mm -hmm. And each of the topics discuss communication skills in one way, shape, or form. Social skills, emotional intelligence, public speaking, creativity. And by learning from short stories, it serves as a machine gun for the mind, where you're getting a whole bunch of different angles. And it's helping you question your experiences and it will lead to more practical benefits in the long run versus someone just lecturing you, hey, this is how you become a better communicator. Yeah. So Wordplay is a short story book, mm -hmm. a, a collection of a variety of topics all under the umbrella of communication skills. Yeah. And each one is roughly 800 words to 1,000 words. So all of them are quick little reads. That's awesome. Um, very cool. And I think that's a great... To, it's a unique way of getting these ideas across, telling short stories, um, 101. And I like that for our current age. And I'm definitely going to check it out. The link is in the description if you want to, the Amazon link. And um, let's talk about storytelling. I know it's a little off script. How, how do you become good at storytelling? Like how does someone work out that muscle to become a good storyteller? So storytelling at the fundamental level is the connection of ideas, okay? That's probably not a definition that you're going to see if you Google it. If you Google it, people have very flowery definitions for storytelling. Oh, you need uh, this. You need compelling characters. You need a setting, which are all true, but those are derivatives. Uh, it's smarter to learn basic division before you try to learn long division. Mm -hmm. So the basic definition of storytelling is a connection of ideas. Okay. Now, the byproduct of that is that at the core level, every story that we consume has a character, conflict, and lesson. Okay. So if you can understand those two definitions, now it becomes much easier to get started on storytelling. Yeah. 
I recommend if someone wants to improve storytelling, start off with yourself. You're already the character. I'm sure you've had plenty of different conflicts in your life. Now it's time to find the lesson. Yeah. So if you keep doing that, then you prime your mind to start seeing in stories. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of self-improvement culture doesn't like Netflix or doesn't like any form of entertainment. But I believe this is also a good way to learn storytelling because you're seeing the end product of screenwriters, actors, movie directors, writers as a whole connecting to- together to build their storytelling muscle. Yeah. So if you're going to be watching Netflix or any form of entertainment, just keep asking yourself, who are the characters? What is the conflict? And what is the lesson? Okay. Notice I didn't say happy ending. I just said lesson. Yeah. And with these three, you start to create sunglasses for the mind to start uh, perceiving content in a different way. So just a quick little recap. Yeah. Storytelling is the connection of ideas. All great stories have at a fundamental level, character, conflict, and lesson. Mm-hmm. To learn storytelling, start off with yourself first. You're yeah. the character. Uh, start finding different conflicts and start extracting the lessons from it and you start getting better and better. I like that. It really simplifies it. Like you were saying, codifies it. It's a way you can just see it out there in the world. Um, I'm of the camp of don't watch TV mm-hmm. <laughs> or don't watch Netflix. Yeah. And that makes me think about it differently. I could become a better storyteller in public speaking if I maybe limited it and looked for stories out there on Netflix because there's big budgets and stuff on HBO and Netflix. For sure. And I completely get that perspective as well because yeah. some people, they overdo TV so much where that's all they do. They just keep watching TV. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if you, let's say someone's not in the TV camp where they're like, nah, they just end the Netflix. Well, guess what? Books, uh, read fiction. Uh, uh, Nonfiction is great. Nonfiction has stories as well, but fiction as a whole, uh, preferably science fiction gets you thinking in a completely different way. And it cheat codes, the whole storytelling process because you're being forced to turn words into out of world images. Okay. So say someone doesn't like TV or doesn't even, cause I know a lot of people that just dump out their TV nowadays, Yeah. then use fiction books, comic books, the same formula applies. You're looking for character conflict lesson, character conflict lesson, mm-hmm. and then it becomes easier and easier to tell stories. But the only way you're actually going to become good is by telling stories. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's true. I like that. You ever heard of the one minute story? I never have, no. So it- if someone wants to get started, uh, just practice telling one minute stories. Um, of It doesn't have to be compelling. It doesn't have to be entertaining. But just see if it could have a character conflict and lesson. And it just, it helps you out. It helps you with a simplification muscle. It helps you with imagination. It helps you become more creative and much more. So it's a little exercise. Right. Tell some one minute stories. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that's a great point. It's like you, you learn stuff best by doing it. I think in school, we all learn to like get a bunch of facts in our brain, but if you don't apply it, it's like, it all goes out the window, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's like <laughs> someone like, for example, reading all these financial planning books, but yeah. they're, you know, they're saying all the formulas to you and yeah. you're like, okay, have you actually done anything with it? They're like, no, <laughs> and they don't really know it. So yeah. I can tell from your office that y- you, you do the work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's true. It's like um, you ask them like, <laughs> you know, like I'm deeply in debt. No, I don't do that. I don't pay myself first. I pay myself last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that's cool. Um, I wanted to ask a few final questions. I wanted to say if anyone's watching live, you have a chance to put a question in the chat for Armani Talks Live if you want to do that. Um, but I'm going to wrap up here with my final questions. I wanted to ask one question on charisma and you mentioned cheat codes. What's a cheat code for having more charisma? Say for someone who's slightly awkward, what's a cheat code to get that better? Two tips, advancing yeah. personality and 70, 30 rule. Uh, advancing personality is you just leave someone a little bit better off than you found them. Just a little bit better. Yeah. And when you make that the intention oh, I got to make, uh, leave someone a little bit better. Not only do you cure your social anxiety, you're focusing more on the other person. Mm-hmm. And if you're setting that as the intention, 
just make him a little bit better, then that is already charisma as a whole. Because charisma is a very holistic process. Mm -hmm. It's not about what you say and all that kind of stuff. It's like at the end of the day, when people are assessing whether or not you are charismatic or not, Mm -hmm. it's whether or not you made them feel good or you took away the energy. That's it. That's how their subconscious mind makes a decision. Mm -hmm. Now, the next part is a 70-30 rule where you should listen or try to listen 70% of the time and speak 30% of the time. And this is just a general heuristic. Obviously, you can adjust it. Uh, Like, for example, if I'm doing the interview and I'm just listening 70% of the time (laughs) and I'm making you speak most of the time, it doesn't make much sense because this is an interview. So you could adjust the numbers. Mm -hmm. But whenever entering a new situation, uh, allow them to speak a little bit more and listen. Mm -hmm. Don't just hear. Listen. Hearing is physical. Listening is mental. Hearing any dummy can do. Uh, you just show up and you're getting the audio signals into your brain. Not, uh, but listening is audio, physical, plus mental. So this is when you have two different types of listening. I don't want to get too technical, by the way. But since we're here, two types of listening inclu- includes trampoline and sponge. Sponge is when you just absorb the data. And this is typically the preferred form of listening when you're a shoulder to cry on. Someone's parents passed away, you're sponge listening. Trampoline listening is what you should traditionally be doing. And this is when you're getting their point and you're amplifying it. You're paraphrasing what they said. You're asking questions. You're contributing, telling jokes, all forms of trampoline listening. Yeah. Do that 30% of the time. Allow them to speak 70% of the time. And that's another charisma formula. Awesome. I'm an engineer. So I got to, you know, give you some of these numbers as well. I got to codify it, you know? Yeah. I can see an engineer being, well, let me test out 71%. <laughs> <laughs> this is my hypothesis. <laughs> that's what. <it> is. <laughs> um, yeah, that's awesome. I had a question here, but I think I've already asked this. So I just wanted to ask um, when it comes to like the work that you do, What's, what's like a pivotal moment in your life that has shaped how you see the world today that is kind of like molded the way you see the world today? The, what showed me, what I saw was that technical knowledge is just going to get you so far. And, th- you know, there was a period in my career where, you know, for my first ever job, I was, you know, learning so much. I knew the system that I was managing inside and out, mm-hmm. but I just didn't quite understand how to communicate it like a person. It it was extremely difficult and I was overly formal. And what I started to understand was that humans crave informality, Mm. which requires a whole bunch of unlearning because in school, we're taught to be formal, you know, show up, show up to class at this time, sit down, raise your hand, which isn't necessarily bad. We need certain formal rules, the society scales. But I came to learn that, If you want to cheat code like ability, be a little informal. And, you know, throughout my engineering career earlier on, I saw that a lot of people were uh, who were very, very qualified to get a promotion, didn't get the promotion because they just didn't they didn't make others feel good. They, it's not like you just want to be the feel good kind of guy, but they were traditionally working in their cubicle uh, and they were typically the kind of people that are like, this is wrong with the system. This is wrong with the system. It's yeah. kind of poking holes while someone else who didn't have that much technical knowledge was more curious and they knew how to make others feel good. And this group got promoted while this group didn't. Yeah. This group made others feel like a winner this group uh, made others doubt themselves. So that's, those are like certain moments that kind of shifted my worldview where, you know, after most people graduating high school, college, they're thinking in a very rigid, formal way Mm -hmm. where I think the real world kind of gets us to open up our worldview a little bit more and understand the role of personality, soft skills, and don't just be someone who's charismatic, be intelligent, and be charismatic, do yeah. both, not just one. Then you're unstoppable. I love it. Then you become unstoppable because, you know, 
we we have this dualistic mind a lot in the west where in the east it's a synergy process and i believe both are needed but you know if someone just comes up to you and is like i do you, which arm do you want to keep you know uh, which arm do you use the most you're like i'm right handed but i want to keep both arms because both arms serve a purpose mm-hmm. same with intellect and social skills you don't just want to be that smart guy that know it all uh, that delivers everything in a sharp tonality is mm-hmm. mean or you don't just want to be the airhead charismatic person who's just saying a bunch of random things but there's no meaning behind your words you want to combine the two which that's how people should be thinking in my opinion yeah combine the two together um it's not one or the other i like that um i got a comment here i'm going to go through your social media real quick so people can follow you and then i'm going to ask my final question um and then i got one question in the comments if you want to answer it you can for sure Um, it's so the book that you have it's called wordplay 101 short stories essays and insights to improve communication skills that's on amazon the link is below and really unique way of looking at getting those ideas in your head of how you can improve your communication skills. And that, that leads to money. I mean, that's just like, I'm a financial planner that that leads to money, having better communication skills. Cause if you're going to do business with someone, you want it to be someone you like. I've never thought like, I want to go work with this person who I can't stand being around. You want to work with someone that you like, right? Right. Um, link tree. So I have that also your link tree with all your social media, but your website is Armani talks.com. YouTube is, you know, youtube.com slash Armani Talks. Twitter at Armani Talks. Highly recommend. That's where I found. And you get, you have so many great ideas that I, I can't even like say them all, but there's so many great ideas of how you can reframe social things that are bad or seem bad into good things in social and communication arenas. And then your Instagram, Armani Talks. And then the Armani Talks podcast is available everywhere you can find podcasts. <laughs> is that correct? Did I miss anything? No, you got everything. Awesome. Um, so one question I had in the chat was, could you tell us a one minute story? <laughs> sure. So there was a guy named Joseph who hit a boy named Paul up for a podcast interview. And Paul said to Joseph, you know, I will attend your interview, but you have to dress up as a ballerina and you have to show me that clip. Because if you show me that clip, then I'm going to see that you really want this interview. Paul says, I'm a very highly sought after person. So Joseph was in a predicament. Um, He didn't want to dress up as a ballerina, but he needed Paul on the interview to get his show off the ground. So he had an idea. He decided that he was going to ask his twin brother to dress up as the ballerina. And his twin brother agreed to do so. That day, Paul ended up coming into the interview, he saw that Joseph was serious and the interview was about to start. Right before it started, YouTube's streaming services officially shut down. And unfortunately, the interview never happened. Oh, (laughs) yeah. And the lesson, oh, go ahead. (laughs) This was a lesson about, see, a lot of stories, by the way, Mm -hmm. you're never supposed to give always a pure direct lesson okay some of it needs to be open-ended so the other person can interpret it oh i see and so in this situation the lesson that i wanted to give was how bad do you want it and what sort of creativity are you going to do and can you put your pride to the side in order to make a certain things happen in the real world okay awesome i like that and that's a good point. Yeah, you don't want to be like, this is the lesson. It's not like an Aesop fable all the time. Well, and that's one one thing that um, when I was first working with a few clients, um, a lot of the engineers, when they were given the um, character, conflict, and lesson formula, they would kind of articulate. So the character of my story was this guy. And yeah. then, the you know, they're kind of like listing it out, sort of like a scientific project. And it's just like in the real world, storytelling is more ambiguous where different people see the same thing, but they come away with different insights. Yeah. Very cool. I love that. I want to respect your time. So I'll ask my final question here. And it's if you could leave the audience with one final message, what would that be? 
keep grinding. I mean, keep repeating. Um, see, a lot of my advice is always long-term oriented. I don't believe in much shortcuts. Uh, I mean, whatever you want to get good in, I recommend you put in the repetition. Uh, just keep working hard. Create a schedule. Stick by it. And uh, integrity in itself is a business plan nowadays. So you don't want to be known um, as the guy that screws people over. You, you want to be the kind of guy that you know adds value, leaves others better off than you found them, and always think long term. So I know you asked for one thing, but that's just kind of like a package of different things, of yeah. ideas that the Armani Talks brand stands for. I love that. Yeah. And all of Armani Talks' information is in the description if you want to um, you know, check out his social media, check out his books and stuff like that. And is there anything else you'd like to say, Armani? No, I mean, I appreciate you for having me on. I had a lot of fun. You're great at, you know, asking good questions, listening. So I had a lot of fun in this interview. Yeah. Thank you too. I'm, I'm glad to have you on. So it's my pleasure here. Um,